So the title, as you can see, is Show Us the Father. And I thought a, a good scripture reading, I thank you, Corey, for the scripture reading this morning, was a text that we all know and understand. It, we've heard it a hundred times, maybe a thousand times, and yet um, maybe we don't stop and think about the weight of what this text really says. <clears throat> You're going to have to excuse me. I have had a cold off and on, and uh, I'm going to be coughing. Mark, maybe you can cut some of those things out <laughs> uh, of the video. We're recording this video, and uh, <clears throat> I hope it can be something uplifting because some of the things that I want to talk to you about today are very important in the plan of salvation in the workings of the gospel plan that God has set forth with his son for us. And I do want to thank um, some of the people that we've been in ministry with from around the world. Um, uh, a lot of the thoughts and the scriptures were taken from a sermon done by my friend Adrian from uh, Australia. And you know, as we have been in ministry and in partnership with some of these people from Oklahoma, from Georgia, from Minnesota, uh, from New York City, from Australia, um, we've made it clear to these people that any material that we put out, whether it's in print or on video, they're welcome to use it, to take parts of it, because the gospel, you know, it's not exclusive. God is not partial to any man. And uh, they have said the same thing to us, that, that if there's a message or thoughts or understanding that we glean from the things that they have given, uh, to go ahead and use those things. And so I thought the message that uh, I heard about and have seen over the last week or two was just tremendous. And uh, we need to understand I think it's imperative that we understand straight from the Word of God the plan that God has laid out through His Son. And so as I get started this morning, the first verse here, 14 of John chapter 3, uh, indicates to us that the Son of Man is going to have to be lifted up, not only in a physical sense on the cross, which I think this directly refers to, but He's going to have to be lifted up in our hearts and minds. And then the promise in verse 15, that if we believe in Jesus, we have the hope of salvation, of eternal life, that we're not going to perish eternally. And then verse 16, the one we're very familiar with, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, do we believe these words? Truth. Are they truth? Are they literal in what they say? That God had a son to give his only begotten son. And when we believe these things, that God had a son to give, he is who he says he is, the only begotten son of God, that we're not going to perish, but we're going to have access to this everlasting life. And then verse 17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn us. Uh, I guess we do a pretty good job of that ourselves. We condemn ourselves by our own actions and thoughts, by our own worship. But he sent his son into the world that through him, that's through Jesus, the only begotten son, we might be saved. Tremendous passage when we stop and think about what it really says. So that's really uh, the crux of my sermon today, the crux of my message and, uh, but I want to move on. Uh, if you want to follow along in your own version of the Bible, I'm going to have, I think, all of the scriptures I've put on the PowerPoint screen today. Let's move along. I want to move to John chapter 14. And I hope you can see these things from where you're sitting. Um, but I just want to read John, a portion of John chapter 14 that goes along with, uh, the title of my message today. Starting in verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now let's stop just for a minute and think about these words. 
What's Jesus trying to tell us? He's telling us that our ultimate goal is to come to the Father. Do you get that from these words? Our ultimate goal is to get access to the Father in some way. Now, I believe that the Father is the source of all life for the universe. And I have a text uh, at near the end of the presentation today that's going to bring that out fairly strongly. So if the Father is the source of all life, Jesus is pointing out that he is the way to the Father, the truth of what the Father is, who the Father is, and he is the conduit of life from the Father to us. But he's saying to his disciples here, continuing in verse 7, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, in other words, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Interesting words. But Philip, this is one of Jesus' disciples, saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. In other words, it'll be sufficient if you just show us the Father, then we'll be content with that. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet thou hast not known me? Interesting. He, he really, Jesus has a way of understanding what we're really asking for. What we're really asking for. And Jesus changes, uh, I guess, the, the question that Philip should have asked, he changes the answer to answer a question that Philip should have asked, okay? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Now let's talk about this for a minute. Is Philip asking to see physically the Father? He might be. He might be. But what Jesus is answering him is not about a physical seeing. It's got to be more than that. And in fact, I think my slide continues in the John chapter 14. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? It's a spiritual understanding that the Father dwells in the Son and the Son dwells in the Father. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In other words, they could see the things, the miraculous things that Jesus had done, but not only the miraculous things, but the tender things, the beautiful character of God is coming out through his Son. In other words, believe in Jesus because of these things that you have seen. And surely, surely, or verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, the, the, this is an interesting text, and a whole series of sermons could be based on this one text. But my point is this. Is it physically possible for us to see the Father? Is it physically possible? And, and the answer should be no. We are sinful beings. And in fact, in the scripture it says, no man has seen the Father at any time, but Christ Jesus has revealed the Father to us. And this is what John chapter 14 here is talking about. This is, this is what Jesus is trying to lay out to his disciples and to us. But let me ask you this. If we were not sinful beings and sinful in our very nature, would it be possible to physically see the Father? I mean, does the Father have a physical form? Yes, he does. The Bible is clear that he dwells in light unapproachable. He has a physical form. And, you know, there's many scriptures in the, that talk about God having a, uh, an arm that he reaches with. He has a heart. He has a mind. He has eyes that he can see us with. Why has no one seen the Father? And you know, when in verse 6, let me go back. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And if you get into the Greek here, 
This no man, that word man is not in the Greek. It doesn't mean man per se. But I'd like to suggest to you that it's not only man that Jesus is talking about, but all created beings have access to the one tr true God by Jesus Christ. No matter whether we are sinful or matter whether we are an angel that has never sinned, we have access and we understand the Father through the life of Jesus Christ and what he presents. So let me go forward. And uh, I want to get to the next text. If you're following along in your Bibles, we're headed to Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. We're going to change gears a little bit and ask, what does God want us to see in him? What does God want us to know about him? What kind, and, and if we understand what God wants us to know about him, the truth of who he is, then we will have the relationship with God that he wants us to have with him. So here in Jeremiah, verse 23 and 24, we find out what God wants us to know about him. Thus saith the Lord, that's Jehovah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord Jehovah, who exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Now, as we think about this text, it's very plain to me what God wants us to glory in. Now, in this verse, does God talk about how great he is, that he's the creator of everything? Does he talk about his might in spreading the stars in the sky? Are those the things that we need to glory in? Uh, does God talk about how he's powerful enough to create everything that we know and understand, to give life to every living thing in the universe? No. God talks about that we should glory, that we understand that he gives loving kindness that he gives proper judgment and righteousness in the earth. This is what God really wants us to know about him. He wants us to know who he is with an understanding of what he does. You know, this harkens back to uh, a, an account in the Bible in 2 Kings of a king of Israel called Hezekiah. And I'm not going to go to this text. In, it's in 2 Kings chapter 20. You know, Hezekiah was a reasonably good king compared to some of the other ones. And uh, there came a time in his reign where he invited the Babylonians to come in, where they came in, and they took, he showed them all of his kingdom and everything that God had given him, okay? But Hezekiah made one mistake, and that is that he showed all the Babylonians and the authorities of Babylon all the things that God had done for him. He showed him all the silver and the gold and all the riches and everything of, of the kingdom of Israel. And it, the kingdom was very wealthy at that time. And let me tell you, the Babylonians were impressed by this. But Hezekiah, he showed them the riches and the fame of this government that God had made him the head of. He showed them the riches and the fame and the glory and, the, and the, all the wealth and everything, but he failed to show them the true God of Israel. He showed them what God had done, but not the true character of God. Let's continue. I'm going to move to Exodus chapter 34. And we're going to find out what God showed Moses on the mountain. Now, you know, Moses must have 
had a very strong relationship with God. Here he is up on the mountain. He's been up on the mountain with the 70 elders from time to time. But at this point, he really wants to see the glory of the Almighty God. He really would like to see God face to face. And this is what happens. You know, he, he, I'm sure Moses is trembling, thinking about seeing even the back parts of God, because God said, you cannot see my face and live. In fact, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of this rock here. Isn't that interesting? The cleft of the rock, which represents Jesus Christ. And I'm going to hide you with my hand. I'm going to put my hand over this crag of the rock where you're hidden. The right hand, again, again uh, signifies Jesus Christ. And, and I'm going to pass by. But even then, even though you can't see past the rock and, and past my hand, I'm only going to pass by so that you can see my back parts. You're not going to see my face. And what was Moses really wanting? He was wanting to see the glory of God. The glory of God. Can we imagine that? The most powerful being in all the universe. And here in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. What does it say? Merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will, but will no, by no means clear. Remember, Elijah went up on Mount Carmel, and when he prayed, he was calm about his prayer. You know, all, all the, the priests of Baal, they were yelling and jumping around all day long. They, the Bible says they even cut themselves. It was loud. It was raucous. It was, well, it wasn't a still, small voice. But when Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel, he called all the people near to him, and he gave a simple prayer simple calm prayer to the one true god of heaven asking humbly that god would change the hearts of the people and god performed a miracle but this is after that this is when elijah was in hiding and let's read here what it says <clears throat> first kings chapter 19 and verse 11 and 12 and he said go forth this is god speaking to elijah and stand upon the mount before the lord and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, 
But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Connected to the wealth, the powerful, the famous. But God is asking us to take our attention off those things, not to worship those things, not to worship the things that God has made or created, but to worship the God that has created and made those things. We understand God's powerfulness to some extent. But ultimately, it's difficult to understand an all-powerful being. A being that has no beginning and has no ending. In fact, from the scripture, when people have encountered, people from the scripture have encountered spiritual beings, be beings of glory, uh, angels of light, there's an account from John where he bowed to an angel because of the glorious light and the presence that angel put off. But the angel said, do not worship me. I'm just a reflection of the glory of my heavenly father. That's what we can take from that. So I wanna switch gears a little bit and uh, take you back to the beginning and uh, that's in Genesis. I'm going to move to Genesis chapter 10, and I want you to notice something carefully in Genesis chapter 10. <clears throat> if we start at the beginning of Genesis chapter 10, which I'm not going to, it's, uh, it's talking about the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the first 10 verses, uh, well, eight, seven verses, just talk about the genealogy that went forth from Noah and his sons. And it's interesting, it doesn't say anything about these particular men that were born being the sons of Noah and his sons. It just gives a relational understanding. In other words, you know who I am in this particular context by who my father is and who his father is and who his father is. There was no need at that time to say, well, this person did this particular thing and that person did that particular thing. But we get down here to verse 8 and 9, and we can see that there's a change from a relational understanding to a power understanding. In other words, it's not who I belong to that's important anymore. It's what I've done and my capabilities, what I can do, the power that I have. And let's read this text. And Cush begat Nimrod. This is right at the end of the genealogy here. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, the marginal reading here of this word mighty one would be an overbearing tyrant, 
is what some Bibles say. An overbearing tyrant in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the marginal reading before here could mean against the Lord. An overbearing tyrant against the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty or overbearing hunter was against the Lord. Here in verse 9. Let's continue. In the beginning of his kingdom, whose kingdom? Nimrod's kingdom was Babel and Erech and Echad and Kalna, I'm not good at these names, sorry, and the land of Shinar. Interesting to note that this is the first use of the word kingdom in all of scripture. So we see this change take place. It's not who I'm related to, the relational aspect of where I come from that's important now among the sons of men. It's that Nimrod was this overbearing tyrant, a hunter, a mighty man of valor. Now let's continue with this thought. We're going to go back to Genesis, further in Genesis chapter 6, and I'll demonstrate this a little more. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, this was before the flood, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, in other words, the followers of God, and if you do a little research, you'll find out that these sons of God were the offspring of Seth, the replacement for Abel. Saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all of which they chose. Now these daughters of men, these were people that did not follow God's God's direction. And if you do a little research in the scripture, it's very plain that these daughters of men were the descendants of Cain. Well, what do we have here? What's the Bible trying to teach us? That at this particular point in time, before the flood, there was an amalgamation. There was a combining of good, the good people, people who wanted to follow God. Obviously, they didn't make a very good choice here in taking on the daughters of those that did not want to follow God. What, is this, what does this boil down to? What does it come down to? Confusion. Confusion is what this truly boils down to. And hence, that's what we end up with through the flood and the Tower of Babel. You know, this confusion leads to an understanding that we don't know where we came from or what we're all about. The relational aspect of who I, I'm someone because I'm a son, of, adopted son of the Almighty God. And through the generations, I'm the son of so-and-so who's the son of so-and-so. The relational aspect is lost by this because there's an amalgamation. And now men are seeking their worth, not from where they came from, or their relation, but about they're seeking their worth from what they can accomplish, how much fame they have, how large their kingdom is, like we saw in Nimrod, and how mighty and powerful they are. Have you ever been to a graduation, maybe? Or maybe you've heard uh, a speaker introduced somewhere? And how is that speaker usually introduced? Have you, have you ever heard, uh, let's say, uh, you've been to maybe a graduation and you've heard a speaker introduced. Have you ever heard a, an introduction that goes something like this? This is so-and-so, and he's the son of so-and-so and so-and-so, and he's a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, son of the Almighty God. Have you ever heard anything like that? No, I never have either. What do we usually hear? We usually hear, oh, this is so-and-so, and he spent 14 years in the Trans-European Division as the director of such-and-such and so-and-so, such and, so and, so. and before that, he spent 12 years in the, at uh, university on the staff of such-and-such and so-and-so, such and, so and, so. and he has a PhD and a master's degree from this particular university. What's it all about? It's about the accomplishments of this particular human being. Not 
that he is, has an open, honest, ongoing relationship with the God of heaven. And that's why we should listen to him. But it's about what his accomplishments have been in life. We're directed to listen to this individual because of all the knowledge and understanding he's received from other men. You see, we do seek, as human beings, we do seek the rich and the powerful, the good-looking. You know, this is promulgated by our human sinful nature. What a difference this is to a most powerful God. Are we attracted to God because of who he is, because he's powerful, because of what he does, or because of who he is? We're attracted to God. In fact, God has a very difficult time with this problem of ours because we would be attracted to the most powerful, the most beautiful, the wealthiest being in all the universe. Everything belongs to him. Are we attracted to God because of what he has? Because of obviously his glory and his brightness? Are we attracted because he's most powerful? Because of what he can do for us? It's a, an extreme barrier between who God is. We don't want to know who he is. We're, it's a barrier because we want a God that we have access to his power, his beauty, his wealth, and those are the things that we are attracted to. But we've seen that God wants to reveal not those things to us, but what his true character is, who he truly is. You know, uh, for those here this morning, we sang our opening song, How Great Thou Art, and <clears throat> we had a song sheet with the words on it. And I thought it was very interesting, um, the words to this song, that's why I chose it this morning. And I put the words to this uh, particular song. It's very well known throughout the Christian world. How great thou art, verse 1. Now, I'd like you to notice the progression in this hymn. It's beautiful. We, do, we are attracted to God. By in awesome wonder, we see all the worlds, we consider all the worlds that his hands have made. Maybe that's the first attraction, what God has made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power of who God is. Thy power throughout the universe is obviously displayed to us. In fact, um, there's a text in the New Testament. It is, uh, I know the verse, is it Romans 1.20? It is. That says uh, that there's no excuse because we've seen the power of God in creation. There's no excuse for us. And he does draw us through his power, but he wants us to know something deeper. Verse 2 we get a little closer to who God truly is. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, we're getting closer to an intimate, the intimate character of God. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the, word, hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, the simple things that God has created reveal more about his character than all the stars that he has spread throughout the universe. But let's go to verse 3. Here's the true understanding of God's character. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, he didn't even spare his only begotten son, he sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. You see the progression? That we get closer and closer to the heart of God and further away from the things that he can do for us, his power, his might, further away from those things. And of course, the fourth verse is about the second coming of his son. But how can we know him? How can we truly know this being that is beyond our comprehension? See, we have an origin and we have a beginning. We understand everything that has an origin, pretty much. Every house or, or, or building that's ever been built had a time when it was built, and there'll probably be a time when it ends. 
Even the trees that come up, we understand that they started from seed. Even the very earth itself, we understand that it was created by God. It has an origin, it has a beginning. How could we possibly get close enough to this all-powerful, all-knowing being to understand who he is, what his character is like? Romans 11, 33 and 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom, wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Could we give anything to God that he doesn't already have? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. This text speaks of the power and the authority, the omnipotence, the all-knowingness of God Almighty. But we can know God. We can know God because of the bridge that is formed through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, somewhere in the middle of having no origin and being created beings that we are, God has placed someone halfway in between. His son. So in between this almighty God with no origin and in between him and us, is Christ Jesus, this bridge to the Father which we have been given. My next text is 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16. Remember the first text I shared with you after John 3, 16 was about Jesus showing us the Father. And this is what this text says also. That thou keep his commandments without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, what's he going to show us? Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Christ Jesus is going to show us the Father. He is showing us the Father today. But you know, if we take away Christ's origin, if we take away his coming forth from the Father, how could he be a bridge to us, to this unknowable being from our standpoint? If you take Christ's origin away, like most of the Christian world wants to do today, you truly take away this bridge, his, his ability to bridge us to the Almighty. And you know, Satan has tried very hard to do away with this understanding, this bridge. And you know, it, it, it's ironic, it truly is, then, that when we talk to most Christians, they are horrified when we say that Christ has an origin. They are truly horrified to that because they say, when we say that, we're taking away Christ's divinity. We're taking away Christ's divinity when we take away his origin. But the very thing that they accuse us of proves Christ's divinity. His origin from his father, like begats like, proves the very divine nature of Christ Jesus. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Christ proceeded forth from his father. Well, you know, if you take away the bridge, if you take away Christ's origin and make him just like the Father, no wonder the nominal churches say today that God is a mystery. We cannot understand him. 
And it's because they've taken away Christ's origin, this bridge that we have to the Father. Below, it, I, I want to make this point before I bring this, this slide into our view. Even in Christ's day, Satan had done a masterful job of hiding who Christ really was going to be when he came to the earth. And these two texts really show that. But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? I'm telling you, in their heart of hearts, they knew that Jesus Christ was the anointed one. They knew he was the Messiah. But, or how be it, we know this man whence he is. In other words, they understood where he came from. He was born in Nazareth. We know who his father and his mother are, Joseph and Mary. So therefore, in their preconceived ideas, they could say this. But when Christ comes, no man knoweth whence he is. In their heart of heart, they knew who Jesus was. But when they put their mind in gear, and they put their preconceived ideas that no man knows where Christ comes from, he has no origin, no beginning, the Messiah has no origin, no beginning, this man can't be the Christ, because we know where he comes from. It's the same thing today, friends. Because we understand the scripture to say that Christ has an origin, the churches today say, no, that can't be the true Christ. Because he has to have no origin. That's our understanding. Well, I'm sorry, the Bible reveals that Christ has an origin. He has a father. The, the Son of God has a true and literal father. That's the almighty, one true and living God. You know, the focus shifts from God's power and us wanting to be close to him because of his power, what he can do for us, his beauty, his might, when we understand the relationship that God has with his son. The beauty of the oneness of their relationship. That Christ had to have faith in his father not only here on this earth, but throughout all of his existence. That his life comes from his Father. In fact, it's only through the Sonship of Jesus Christ that we see the loving fatherhood of God. Let me go back. This is John 14 again. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient to us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? When we look to Jesus, we see the perfect image of our Heavenly Father. We see in Jesus the love, the long-suffering, the patience, the forgiveness, the mercy that he has. And that is what God wants us to know about who he is and his character. Through Jesus, we can see through the fire. We can see through the whirlwind through the earthquake to see the true almighty God and his loving kindness.